In part two, we're going to be also looking for the fingerprints of God. Additional fingerprints include evidence of dynamic DNA, the oxygen producing jolly green chloroplasts in plants, the mighty mitochondria who produce in every cell all the energy we need to live life. And finally, only God can provide the spark of actual life. Now the first thing we're going to look at is the formation of the earth when it is started. It started 4.6 billion years ago and of course it's a planet so it's but it's still molten, it's still on fire but it happens to exist relative to the Sun at what we call the habitable zone so just the right distance from the Sun not too close not too far but it's pretty hot so along the way it starts to cool and the early atmosphere forms but it doesn't have any oxygen in it then the land and seas form Fortunately, we're bombarded by the asteroid Thea that brought carbon and water, which we know were necessary, and that hit about four, 4 billion years ago. Then along about 3 billion or 2.5 billion, you start getting the very earliest life forms, which are called archaea and bacteria. Now, both of these still exist today. The archaea are found in the ocean, in the hydrothermal vents, and the bacteria we know are on land because we can get strep throat and we get infections they're still they're still around but most bacteria are very helpful for instance we have it in our gut to digest food and they uh, so but they began quite early then the earth continued to cool the land and seas formed and uh, but the land was all in one big blob and uh, later it'll pull apart to make the continents like we know today so the early life forms came about two and a half billion years ago, but at one billion years, another miracle happened, and they developed what we call eukaryocytes. Now, it's a funny word, but just think of the U as you, Y-O-U. So it's your, and karyocyte means cells. So these are your cells, and these are cells that are going to be able to use oxygen. Along the way, some of these early bacteria started to form oxygen, but all of a sudden, when you have eukaryocytes, they're going to go on to make animals and plants. And we're going to talk about all that. So that is one billion years ago. Then, between there and 541 million years, so we've gone from billion down to millions, the Earth is going to develop oxygen in the atmosphere, and the eukaryocytes start to go in the, into, they derive into animals and plants, and the planets start to creep up on the Earth beginning at 541 years and that's the transition to what we call the Cambrian Eon so that it's called the Cambrian explosion so out of the blue all of a sudden the animals and plants start to develop on Earth and we'll follow that timeline now before we move on I'm going to show you a little analogy we're going to compare a living cell and what it needs to a cell phone so if we begin with the cell, it has to have an outer case. It has what we call a cell membrane, and it's pretty smart. It has to have holes in it that can let only good stuff in and gets rid of debris going out. So it, it's pretty smart. It isn't just a hole in the wall. Now we compare that to the cell phone, and it has a case, and it has holes in it all over the place to let certain functions happen. Now these turn to be, out to be buttons, but these turn out to be nutrients. Then inside our cell we have to have a nucleus and the nucleus has to have DNA. The DNA is the instruction manual for all the processes the cell has to do. It has to make proteins to do all kinds of things. It has to have enzymes and proteins to make structures. For it. it has to build a cytoskeleton inside of it. So the DNA is the instruction manual that's sort of the brains of the outfit and of course you come over to the cell phone and there is the computer the computer is exactly the same it has instructions for the entire phone to work now the next thing is inside the cell are little organelles they're called and these are called mitochondria and the mitochondria is the energy source and it has to be rechargeable all of the time so the mitochondria matches the battery. And this is a rechargeable battery, and these are rechargeable mitochondria that make energy make everything work. It allows everything to work. So it's the energy processor 
This is the energy processor, just like your cell phone. Now, in, in plants, we add one more thing, and that's called the chloroplast. It's a big word, but it's got chlorophyll in it. And guess what color the plants are because of the chloroplast and the chlorophyll? They're green, and it's green for a purpose because of the chlorophyll. So the chloro is the chloroplast, and the plast is what makes it. So there's a chlorine maker. And what this does is take sunlight and carbon dioxide in the air, and it makes oxygen. We're going to talk about that. And that's equivalent, basically, to the function buttons. So the cell phone has an outer coat. It has an energy source. It's got an instruction manual. And it's got special devices to do certain things. And that is equivalent to our cell wall, our nucleus with the DNA, the mitochondria, which have their own DNA, by the way. They have DNA in here, and they have DNA in here. And this comes from your mom. The, but these are maternal origin DNA, and the same with the chloroplasts. Now, we're going to look at the Earth's life timeline. And we want to see what are the very earliest creatures, and they're called archaea and bacteria. They're very simple organisms. They were formed in the sea. They were not on land. This happened somewhere between 2 and 3 billion years ago. And they were the first creatures. And they appeared out of nowhere. So there's no preceding living creatures. There's only the elements floating around in the sea and mostly rock and still molten rock on the land. No vegetation, no animals, no nothing. So the very first animal appears. Now you have to ask yourself, how can that happen? Because it's a tough environment. There is no oxygen. And the early life needed to have this outside capsule right here. It seems simple enough, but where do you get it? It's not in the water. You had to have made it. Interesting. And it had to have holes in it, channels, to let good stuff in and bad stuff out. It had to wait inside that cell. It had to produce energy. And it, so it had to ingest stuff to make the energy out of, which included nitrogen. And these bacteria were able to create, take oxygen, uh, nitrogen out of the water and convert it into usable nitrogen to make primitive DNA. So there was some single-stranded DNA. And where does that come from? They had to have a plan to live, to grow, and to reproduce. All of this was happening in a toxic environment. So the question is, how could this have happened just randomly? It's just absolutely impossible. So the logical answer is that it had to have been created. And that's what we believe is true. Now this is a graph. And it shows you what the atmosphere looked like and what it contained way back at 4 billion years earlier. It had a little bit of carbon dioxide. It had a modest amount of water. It had a lot of nitrogen. And it had a whole lot of methane and ammonia, both of which are quite toxic. So it starts that way. And then down around this 2.5 to 2 billion air years, you start making oxygen from these type of bacteria called cyanobacteria. You don't have to know the name. It just starts to do it. And the oxygen level starts to increase. So now we're going to see the oxygen increase. But it's not going to increase a great deal until we get the eukaryocyte plants. We talked about that happening. And the eukaryocyte plants have chloroplasts. And now you can manufacture oxygen very well. You get a lot of oxygen, and pretty soon the oxygen level gets up to 21%. Now, over time, it varies up and down, and that causes some extinctions that happen. We'll talk about that also. But you can see the oxygen from the eukaryocytes, remember, your, your cells, your cells in the, in the form of plants, makes the oxygen. And so it really builds up to a lot at about 500 million years. And at that point, all the plants start coming on the land, and then later the animals will develop. And we'll show you how that happens. Now we move along Earth's timeline down to one of the more important events, and that's the formation of eukaryocytes. Now karyocyte means cells, and you means a good cell, but it also you can translate it as to your, your cells, because this is where we all came from. The other cells were primitive, but right about a billion years, you had these formation of the eukaryocyte cells. This is a huge 
creative event, as big as the Big Bang, because all of a sudden you were able to take this simple comp simple DNA that they had before, that it was a single-stranded DNA, now you could make double-stranded DNA, put it in a nucleus, and develop a mitochondria, which is a little organelle, that makes energy. This is your this is the engine for every cell, every cell you have in your body. You have to use this and it has to have it's oxygen driven. So it has it's an oxygen metabolism. And also it made chloroplasts. Now you realize that both the mitochondria and the nucleus and the chloroplasts had to generate all new DNA. These are long chains of as we've talked before, long chains of proteins that are able to be used as a template, in other words, it's the instruction manual for everything in the cell to do. So out of the blue, they had to create two new kinds of DNA in the mitochondria and the chloroplasts and go from a single strand to a double strand of DNA in the nucleus. These are incredibly complex events and how it can happen in a toxic soup of the primordial sea is beyond any question. It's just totally unreasonable if it's random. It has to be a creative event. So once you've done that, now we're going to be able to have one form that will have the nucleus, mitochondria, and the chloroplast, and they're going to become plants. And the others will be the nucleus and the mitochondria. They'll drop the chloroplast. Remember, anything green, every green leaf, whatever, has the chloroplast. It's not, a, it's not complex. If it's green, it's got the chloroplast. And so the others are the, so that we can make plants and we can make animals. And once this happens, at about a billion years, and you get down to 541 million years, all of a sudden you have what was called the Cambrian explosion, where all of a sudden we're going to unfold all of the living creatures on Earth right at that point. Now this is our list of the seven major creative events. We talked about the first three in part one, which was the Big Bang, where everything came from nothing. Out of nothing came a whole lot of stuff and a whole lot of energy. There's no explanation. That's a creative event. The supernova, when the, the big stars, the first generation stars, uh, implode and then explode, they blast out all of the elements. The 94 essential elements get blasted out of stardust. Now, we didn't need to. Why did it make them? That's a creative event. But this nifty nebula came along and said, I'm going to collect the stardust, and I'm going to make the second generation stars, like the sun, and I'm going to make planets. And at least our planet, which is somewhat of a miracle, ours got the 94 essential elements. You have to have these elements or nothing's going to work. Now we're on to part two. We begin with the dynamic DNA, and then we'll go to chloroplasts and mitochondria and the spark of life. But the DNA is absolutely remarkable. The DNA is the cookbook for a cell. It's made out of these little amino acids, so the cell has to make amino acids, and that's not easy to do. It has to fix up normal dissolved nitrogen and put it in a form that can be formed into a compound. I mean, who, who, does, who, who did that? I mean, it's, it, it happens out of the blue. That's just an impossibility all by itself. Then it has to take these amino acids and some sugar, a sugar backbone, and it makes them, it arranges them in a long chain. Actually, two chains. And the two chains have to be close together, working together. That's absolutely impossible unless there is a creative event happening. And, but we need all of these DNAs to make all the proteins and the enzymes that we need for life. This is just way too complex to be a random accident. This has to be fingerprint of God. Now here's a picture of a cell. This is the nucleus. It could also be, you have similar things in the mitochondria and in the chloroplast, but they all have DNA. But in the nucleus you have most of it. And this is, of course, the cookbook. So what does it cook up? It has to have a recipe to make the inner and outer cell, cell walls in those membranes. It has to have a recipe to make enzymes to make digestion and metabolism work. It has to have a recipe to allow movement. It has to have a recipe for getting rid of debris. And it has to have a recipe for doing reproduction. It wants to create itself. These are all parts of the DNA in the cell nucleus. And we'll talk about the DNA in the mitochondria 
on a later slide. It was amazing that early cells could form. These are living cells. Up to that point, you have the earth and then all the primordial soup, but there's no life itself. And along the way comes the bacteria formation and the archaea formation. But they just sort of get by. But it's a huge advance once you make your cells, the eukaryocytes, your cells. Make sure you remember that. They added the nuclei with DNA, mitochondria with DNA, and some of them will add a chloroplast. Remember, it's green because it's got chlorophyll, and the plants are all going to be green as well. So what happens? These cells are different than these cells. The eukaryocytes appear out of nowhere. They don't exist from the early cells. They didn't just change over. This is a brand new creation. It has the brand new nucleus, the brand new DNA, and it, ends the, it adds these mitochondria, which remember in our analogy are the batteries. So the mitochondria provides all of the energy for everything to work in the cell. That's a big deal. So it's in both the green cells, which are the, pl uh, animal, uh, the plants, and the other cells, which are the animals. So they both get mitochondria because they both have to use energy. The eukaryocyte animals are going to use the oxygen that are created by the plants. So the plants add this new thing called a chloroplast, which is able to make oxygen and glucose, sugar, out of carbon dioxide and the sun's energy. Absolutely astounding uh, creation. And from that, you're going to get the oxygen formed and the glucose, both of which are needed by animals. So as this chain makes the oxygen and the glucose, and this chain uses it. When we look back at the seven major creative events, remember the Big Bang, everything from nothing, the supernova when it explodes makes elements, up to 94 essential ones, it makes them here, but we're going to need them down here, blows them out of stardust, the Nifty Nebula collects all this debris from the, from the universe, and it spins out a nice star like the sun in a planet like ours. I don't know how many times it does it for other places, but it did it at least for us. And then we talked about the instruction manual, the cookbook for everything in our cells, the DNA, which again came out of, it's just a miracle in itself. It just, why it happened, and it's so complex you just can't even imagine that this happened by random. Now we move on to the jolly green chloroplast because they're a major creative event as well, because both the chloroplast and the mitochondria developed by themselves. There was no, they did not come from changing something else. It's not like it evolved. This, the little cells had something and it got a little bit better. No, this, these, the chloroplast and the mitochondria are absolute creations unto themselves, and that's why we include them as major creative events. Now, we're going to look and see why chloroplasts are a creative event. Why is it such a major change in life? The answer is it enables the circle of life. We're changing carbon dioxide into oxygen, which is necessary for the mitochondrial function to have any energy. If this doesn't happen, then we don't exist. They also make glucose, which is a very necessary part of metabolism, especially for the brain. So muscles can use fatty acids and, and fat, and the brain can only use glucose. So if you're going to have a brain, you have to have glucose, and guess what? These eukaryocytes, your cells that made plants, were able to do that. It had used chlorophyll, so they looked green. It took carbon dioxide, it took sunlight, and it turned, went through the chlorophylls, what we call photosynthesis, and out comes glucose and oxygen on the other side. And that's picked up by the eukaryotic animals. So these eukaryocytes that became animals need this oxygen. They absolutely have the glucose and they have to have oxygen or everything stops. This truly is a remarkable, it's an absolutely remarkable creative event in God's visionary plan. There's just no other explanation. It just can't happen by random events. We move on now to number six of the major creative events which development of the mighty mitochondria, the mighty mitochondria. They're mighty because they make energy. Now, to do this, both the chloroplast and the mitochondria have to have their own DNA. 
that DNA is different from that in the nucleus, which makes proteins, but these go ahead and make specific structures. These made the uh, chlorophyll containing components that makes the oxygen, but the mitochondria make energy. And the energy it makes comes from its own DNA, and it has to run day and night, every minute of the day, and it makes the fuel. This makes the fuel that makes all the cells work. And it's called ATP is what it makes. I won't explain what that means, but just ATP, you'll see that around and you get your science classes. ATP is the fuel. It's like gasoline. You can call that ATP gasoline if you want. It's the energy to make every cell in your body work. If you stop making, if you don't have enough oxygen, then this stops. So we definitely need the oxygen from the chloroplast. Shoots into the mitochondria. And we'll look at the mitochondria because it's really quite complex. And I want you to appreciate how complex it is. Now this is what happened. This cell, this organelle that's inside the cell, they're all over them. We have a lot of them in us, in our every cell that we have in our body. It, it makes this mitochondria cell is very complex. It has its own DNA, and the DNA makes these little channels. And these channels are able to take um, reactive substances. I won't tell you what they are, but there's, there's these substances that come along. And these little channels can separate back to, back to the protons. It can take a proton off and leave an electron. This is back to the very early uh, discussions we had on Earth and the formation of the Earth. Well, it takes the same protons. When you get to the fourth one of these things, these protons shoot through it. There's, there's a hole in it, and that's just like a windmill. This windmill goes around, and it takes early st structures called ADP, and it turns it into an ATP. This is the fuel. This is the gasoline to run everything in the cell. But it uses this simple w windmill to make it. And when, when they come shooting through, they turn this little crank, and the crank, may, I mean, it's, you can't make this stuff up. It's just absolutely the visionary plan of God, our creator. Well, it comes through on the other side, and the oxygen clicks into gear here, and it takes these electrons, and it takes these water, uh, these hydrogens, and it makes water. So if without this thing, then all these are toxic. So the cell would die, but because of oxygen, it doesn't, and it makes good old water, and everything, everybody's happy. But it's very complex, and this has to be just invented in this primordial soup. It's Unbelievable, this is such a creative event. This is the timeline. We're not going to spend much time on it. But once you have the eukaryocytes and life begins, then the biggest event happens, what we call the Cambrian era. And it's, it's when the plants and animals start to move on. So first the plants move on, and then the uh, animals move on. But it, the, you can see it, from the, it starts at 541 million. So we've talked about billions of years down to here. Then all of a sudden, at 541 million years, you start getting all these changes. You have the marine plants, the land plants, then the fishes, and then the uh, four-legged animals show up, then the age of insects and trees, and then the seed-bearing plants. Then it continues with the age of the dinosaurs. You remember that, the Triassic period. And that goes along until, bing, there's an extinction, and they're all gone. But then it starts from the 145 million years down all the way to the present. So we watch this as it happens. You first get the hominids, which are the monkeys, the apes, and uh, those types of animals, and early man. And finally you get down to the homo sapiens, which is us. That's us. And we're created and we're also given a soul at about 75,000 years. We start to function like human beings as they exist today. Everything else uh, acts more like animals. When we get the soul, we now have the we have the ability to self awareness. We know who we are, and we also aware that we've had a creator, which is the whole point of the talk today. Then we move on, somewhere around 66 million, uh, million years ago, down to the present, which is the age of mammals. That's us. Now, looking at the Earth, what happened is that the Earth started it was all one landmass and everything else water. It started to separate with these tectonic plates. We talked about that earlier. And the continents floated around until they ended up where they are today. They're actually still changing a little bit, but it takes so much time. Now, in the age of mammals, you start getting the little animals. The big dinosaurs are all gone. 
The plants are the same as we had all the way along, uh, beginning like at 365 million years ago. The plants are pretty much trees and bushes and plants and grass, all those things. Then along the way, at about 66 million years, you start getting the first primates, which are the, like the monkeys. They happen at about 55 million. Then a little bit later, at 7.5 million years ago, you start getting what we call hominids, which are the apes and chimpanzees, which are certainly much more, they have a much better brain than the monkeys, but they're still not human beings. So down the way, a little bit later, starting at maybe 1.5, but really at 200 million years, we're going, we're going to change more. So you have early man, there's a number of names for them, but they're not the same as us. Until finally, at about 200 million years, you get the Homo sapiens, which we're called Homo sapiens. That's our group. You're a Homo sapien. I'm a Homo sapien. And we have the developed brain with the neocortex. And so we call these the Y chromosome atom, the first atom, and the mitochondrial Eve. And they first appear in the fossil record at 200,000 years. So this is these are our ancestors right here. Now the initial human beings, the very first ones, began were evident in the fossil record about 200,000 years. They lived in northern Africa, but they left no trace other than their skeletons. So we have some skeleton evidence of them. They seemed to function like chimpanzees. They didn't appear to have language. They didn't have art. They didn't have, they didn't left any other part to the record. But now at 75,000 years, there a dramatic change ha happens, and at this time, he, the Homo sapiens all of a sudden developed language. They did cave art. They buried their dead with amulets for the next world, so they had a sense of the afterworld. They had counting sticks, so they already had math. They started forming colonies and cities and towns and moved, and they started migrating around the world looking for a better place to live. We call this event that happens here, and it happened really quite quickly at 75,000 years, the ensouling. This is where what appears to be a human soul is introduced into the initial Homo sapiens. We're all Homo sapiens, but this, and we all have the six-layer brain and all the other structures, but at this point, all of a sudden, in a very sharp timeline, sort of out of the blue, like everything else, they start developing all of these, these activities and these things, they have to be thinking about things. They can't, they're not just reacting, they're thinking about it. They have a sense of self-awareness, and that is what we call, they've developed a human soul, which is our, the part of our brain, or a part of us. There's no specific spot. It doesn't exist, and we can't find it physically uh, even today. But this human soul is what gives us a sense of awareness, and it gives us a sense of well-being. So we know if we feel good, we feel bad. It gives us an ability to talk to God. Now, as it goes down further, at 75,000 years, beginning at 10,000 years, we have, we have a history. We have known civilizations right up to the present. So beginning at 10,000, now we can see actually that the individuals have created whole civilizations which we study. At this point now, we've completed the six major steps of creation where we've made the Big Bang made the universe and it made the early elements. The supernova made all the stars with the 94 essential elements. The Nefty Nebula collected it. Then out of the blue, the cells formed. They had to have their own DNA, which is the instruction manual. They had to have all the structures of a cell just out of the primordial soup. Absolute miracle. Then they had to develop specifically chloroplasts, which had chlorine and therefore they're green. That's why the leaves are all green on all the plants. And they're able to make oxygen and glucose. Now along comes the mito mitochondria, again created out of nothing. There's no preceding structure that just got fixed up. They just came out of the blue. And these are the energy systems. This is the battery for your cell phone equivalent. Well, so it's the energy producer. It's the engine of your, it's the fuel for the engine of your cells. And now we get down to the spark of life and what we're going to call our soul. Now the spark of life happens and only God can do that. Only a creator can give us a spark of life. You can take all of the compounds we've talked about and everything else and they don't live 
There's something magical about it, something specific only to the Creator itself that can make this all come together and turn it on. This spark of life is the key to turn on the engines of creation. This is the greatest of the creative events. And this is why we should all be eternally grateful. Every time you say a prayer, you think about the spark of life that we have. Now, what do we mean by the idea of, of a human soul? Well, the soul is unique. It's a unique part of all of us, but only human beings. We can't point to a specific spot in the brain where the soul exists. We know that we know where we can find areas of, for sensation, movement, memory, language, vision, heart and breathing functions, even personality, all those things. All are found in specific areas of the brain, but not the soul. You can't find it. It appears to be part of what we call the human spirit. It's a spiritual thing, but it's very real. The soul is what creates self-awareness, that we know who we are and where we are and what we're doing. It gives us a sense of goodness. We understand what goodness is, a sense of covenant love. It means more than just physical love. It means connection to people in a loving manner. Then there's a sense of beauty. There's a sense of doing the right thing, a sense of distinguishing truth from falsehoods, and especially provides a sense of well-being and purpose in our life. Without your soul, life seems kind of empty. But with your soul, you have a sense of well-being and purpose. Our soul is what connects us to our God, our Creator. We're so glad that our soul allows us to sense God's presence through the Holy Spirit. That's where the Holy Spirit comes in. Now, God is all around us. He's in nature. That's what we've been talking about, the fingerprints of God in nature. And God is still accessible also through prayer and Scripture. Because remember, the Bible is God's love letter to his creation. Through it, we find knowledge and wisdom and our place in the universe. Our final thought, God, our creator, fine-tuned the universe just like a guitar works. If you want to play a guitar, you want it to sound good and make music. Well, God wanted the universe to be creative, to reproduce, to change with time, depending on whatever happens. That's called adaptive evolution. But now if we look at the idea of fine-tuning, look at the guitar. What did God do? What did our Creator do? He created all the laws of physics for everything to work. He designed some wood to be resonant. He made metal that can be stretched into a wire and vibrate at a specific pitch or sound. What did science do? It discovered you can make a box out of wood. Here's the box. You can stretch wires out. There go the wires. And you can tune them so you can sing and play as long as those strings are perfectly in tune. So here's an example. Here's what a guitar sounds like when it's in tune. That sounds real nice. Well, what if I, if the strings don't match? What if they're out of tune? What does it sound like? That's being out of tune. But the whole, the whole physical universe is all designed to be in tune with each other so we were able to play music and live in a wonderful world. Now, all we've talked about isn't just theoretical. For instance, for the Big Bang, where space was created, planets and stars. So tonight, go outside at night, close your eyes at first, look up at the sky on a clear night, and then open your eyes, and what you will see is the vastness of the universe and realize that it came into being in just an instant of time and it was created out of nothing. And we are a part of it now. Well, what about the supernova and the elementary stardust? And this is elementary means it's the origin of all our elements. They came out of nothing too. So if we go and look at, go online and look up the Hubble spacecraft data about the universe and look at the pictures, and what you will notice is that the whole building blocks of our world, all the essential elements, are floating around in stardust mixed up in space. And they're produced by these real bright stars called supernova. 
These are the ones that are real hot. They collapsed. They got so hot and they compressed everything because of gravity. And it blasted out in space the stardust that contained all of the essential elements from billions of years ago just for us to be used today. We can find the Nifty Nebula because they look like this. You can find pictures, and this is one of the pictures from NASA, just right here. And what happens is mind-boggling, but if you realize that this little astronomical system collected the stardust, you can see it around it, and it put it into this disk, the center of which became the sun, the periphery became the planets, and it put our planet exactly at the right distance from the sun. It's called the habitable distance. That's mind-boggling when you think about it. Well, what about the dynamic DNA, which is the instruction manual for all living cells? Well, we can go look at our cell phone and just think about what's in the cell phone. You've got the outer case, and inside it, you have the battery to give it power. That would be like the mitochondria. But it has this part here, the little computer. And the computer is the same as the little computer in all your cells, which is the DNA. And that's what makes all of our systems work. Well, what about those jolly green chloroplasts? The parts, of the, green, or the, the parts that make the plants green. And who make our oxygen? So just go outside on a nice day. Look up at the sky. Look at the green trees outlined against the sky and you can see all this all this material this chloroplast material make took the carbon dioxide out of the air added a little sunlight and made both sugar glucose so that we can we needed glucose to run our body as fuel but it also made the oxygen that filled up our atmosphere so we could breathe this little chloroplast has its own dna which is a miracle in itself it's certainly a creative event, but you realize that all the stuff that's green, every little plant, every little tree, is contributing to our atmosphere so that we can breathe. We have to be pretty thankful for that. Well, the sixth creative event was the making of the mitochondria. The mighty mitochondria, this are energy engines for life. The mitochondria takes nutrients, takes them into the cell, it takes them into the mitochondria, and because it has its own DNA, its own instruction manual, nuclear DNA is over here and that makes the parts, but the mitochondrial DNA makes the energy to do anything. So a good example, go ahead and put your hand over your heart and feel that beating. Without the mitochondria, it would not beat or exist at all. You watch your dog run through the yard, that's because all the mitochondria are working overtime for him to have fun. Now the last step, of our seven creation events is the spark of life. So if you add up all the parts created by the DNA, the chloroplast, the mitochondria, all the elements, space, time, etc., and put it all together, what's the probability that it would all fuse together to make life as we know it? That's kind of the same as this analogy. What do you think would happen if you have a junkyard full of trash like this and a tornado rips through it? What's the probability at the other end of it, after it passes, you have an airplane all shiny and ready to go with a pilot full of gasoline and ready to fly. That would be an example of random activity. Or you could see a God creator took the trash, took the power, and was created. That's the difference. So you can look around your world and recognize the fingerprints of our creator. They're just everywhere. And you realize that we recognize that, that God is the instigator of all this. He is the creator because he's been giving us a soul that makes us sensitive and recognize God's part in our life. You know, this is amazing. I'm beginning to get it. Once you start looking at the world around you, you will all of a sudden keep finding God's fingerprints everywhere. God lives in his creation.